Welcome to CNATHAS, I'm your host Charles and today we're going to talk about an article that was published in a scientific journal recently. The research is into Upper Paleolithic bead production in the south of France. Now these beads were made of ivory and soapstone uh, and they were found at four different archaeological sites in the south of France. So early archaeological theory argued that the rise of farming was very abrupt. So abrupt, in fact, that the great Australian archaeologist Vera Gordon Child called it the Neolithic Revolution. The contrast between the Mesolithic and the Neolithic was assumed to be very extreme, with the Mesolithic featuring very simple societies, very simple hunter-gatherer groups, um, as nomads throughout the landscape while Neolithic peoples featured extreme complexity and social organisation. This is where we get the stratification of people, where you have states created and then kingdoms developed from that. Despite the collection of decades of archaeological evidence, however, the Paleolithic and Mesolithic archaeologists can't entirely shed that assumption that the Paleolithic and Mesolithic societies are hunter-gatherers were simple folk essentially. So evidence for inferred social structure is lost more often than not because of the scarcity of the Paleolithic sites but as I have said archaeologists harbour preconceived notions of how a Paleolithic society might have operated and these were born from ethnographic sources. It is not safe to assume that the lifestyle and social structure and economy of the San people in the Kalahari Desert is representative, exactly representative, of European Upper Paleolithic hominins. Down with this sort of thing! Careful now! So if we cannot use ethnography to help us understand Paleolithic social structures, what alternative exists? Obviously the archaeological record. So Claire Heckel of the American Museum of Natural History in association with the French uh, National Centre for Scientific Research, analysed these ivory and soapstone beads uh, from four Upper Paleolithic cave sites in the south of France. She has shown two types of modification, both what she calls high and low modification. High modification, more time is employed to sculpt the particular beads, whereas low modification is very quick, very simple working on these beads. What she's looking at here are the highly modified beads. Basket shaped beads are a very interesting form of ornamentation in the region of Aquitaine in southern France. 402 beads were analysed using a software based analysis of high resolution photographic images. And here are the caves from which these beads came from. Okay, so we can show that Upper Paleolithic societies had more complex social structure and economy if we can prove that we are seeing craft specialization. Now, craft specialization can be demonstrated at these archaeological sites, but it depends on how you phrase it and what definitions you use. For example, in the year 2007, an archaeologist, J. Pellegrin, argued that for people who lived in the Upper Paleolithic, the specialization associated with a particular site should be referred to as a mastery, whereas specialization should be applied to anything Neolithic, any mastery or specialization involved in the Neolithic. 
very complex debates about how you should phrase things. And this is what a lot of paleoanthropology and archaeological debate are all about, definitions and how you phrase things. So once we have, are satisfied about the type of words we use, we can then move forward and ask, is there more to Upper Paleolithic societies than we are willing to accept? Hundreds of basket-shaped beads have been found in early Aurignacian layers. We can see where the raw material came from and so imperfectly see early regional exchange taking place. Because of the time and effort needed to make these beads, we are safe to say that a limited number of people crafted these. So whatever the title, be it mastery or specialization, a limited number of people are crafting these highly modified beads. But returning to the raw material of these beads for a moment, this research was not able to build a picture of where the ivory came from and how it was traded. This is for obvious reasons. Unlike soapstone outcrops, ivory does not come from a fixed source. And you cannot hope to understand bead raw materials when the source is biological and dynamic in the landscape. Heckel proposed three models to explain the appearance of the beads at the four different cave sites. Model one suggests centralized production. That is, people crafted these beads at one location, which then ended up at the four cave sites through exchange. Model 2 suggests that there are a number of different independent centres of production at the heart of different group territories. Okay, so you have different groups or different societies in different parts of the region and at the heart of each of those territories is a centre of production. While Model 3 sees nomadic groups crafting the beads at the sites that are analysed. So, how can you figure out what model best represents the evidence we see at these four cave sites? To test these models, all 402 beads were measured to capture the overall shape of each bead. Over 6,000 432 data points were put through a statistical process called Analysis of Variance, or ANOVA for short. The results showed that the beads went through highly standardised methods of production, hence the suggestion of specialisation and therefore a more complex Upper Paleolithic society. So what Heckel essentially did was take data points from each individual bead and sync that into a statistical software and that software then compared and contrasted the dimensions of each individual bead to each other and this result demonstrated that the beads were roughly the same shape, same size, same dimensions, demonstrating a certain standardization in the process of creation. There's a five-step process to creating these beads. Usually you start out with a long bone of ivory, break it up into little segments, and bit by bit start shaping it into the basket shape that we all know and love. So it would seem that Model 2 fits the point data that was captured. The results were compared to similar work done at Neolithic and Bronze Age bead sites from Portugal to Jordan to Motopore Island in Papua to Mesoamerica, the Philippines and India. The level of specialization compared favorably between the Upper Paleolithic groups and the Bronze Age Neolithic groups. The author, Claire Heckel, 
hopes that her research here will be the beginning of more robust research and more robust data sets to learn more about craft specialization in the Upper Paleolithic. Her work here was hampered by the less than stellar radiometric dating of the cave sites. And of course, the data set isn't particularly robust. But I'll leave you with the words of Claire Heckel in the final paragraph of her paper. <laughs> 